Okay, now we're in live. Hi everyone, welcome back to another session with Fresh Dental Shadowing. Today we have Dr. Kapila and she's a general dentist in Chicago, Illinois. Um, she's also the founder of Dentist Coach and this is a program that has different mentorship and coaching op services for de pre-dentals, international dentists, and practicing dentists. And yeah, take it away whenever you're ready, doctor. Hi guys. Um, hi, my name is Dr. Kapila. I um, I am so thankful for Fresh Dental Shadowing Group for thank you for having me here. It's an honor. This is a wonderful platform for all the pre dental students. I think you all are doing an amazing thing over here. They, it's going to be so so much value for all these students. And thank you all the pre dentals and everybody else who has joined us. Thank you for being here with us so for our presentation today for the next hour or so i am going to be telling you all stories about my dental journey i'm gonna uh, share some pre-dental advice that i give to my pre-dental students and my international dentist in my mentorship program and then we are gonna look over some of the cases and uh, do the later part of the dental shadowing during our session hope you all enjoy it guys um so yeah my name is dr neha kapila i am a general dentist in chicago illinois i have been in dentistry since 2002 in different practice settings and in different roles currently i am associated with the dso i am also founder and dental coach at dentist coach all right so let me get started so let's see so my why and inspiration so what is my why so this question will keep coming up throughout uh, your dental journey as it kept coming up in mine and something to keep in mind for everyone not just for right now for possibly your applications or your personal statement but i believe it also helps to keep things in perspective especially when uh, at times things can get hard and challenging it keeps a perspective going positive so we're going to keep coming back to our whys my inspiration for being in dentistry so uh for my inspiration for why I'm in dentistry started early on um, and it was because of my parents. Uh, both of them were professionals and both of them were in social service and seeing them serve people unconditionally um, inspired me to be like them since I was a teen. I wanted to be them. Um, I wanted to be in service to people. I wanted to make an impact in other people's lives. Uh, so I always knew I'll do something in relation to that um, with myself. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm a people person. I love loving on people. I love taking care of them. Um, and I'm in my happy place when I am giving and serving. So a little bit of selfish part of my why. So, and like I said, I come from very humble beginnings and I believe, um, that me having that servant mindset, um, uh, being in, so that what helped me that uh, being in dentistry just came naturally to me. And this is my why that is something that I ca carry in my heart to this day as a dentist and a coach and a mentor. Um, a couple other advice for being in dentistry was also that we thought that, okay, the time schedule is going to be flexible. I'll be able to work in different practice models. I'll be able to specialize if I wanted to. Dentistry is an ever evolving profession. So um, sky is going to be the limit. And I love teaching. So I was like, okay, maybe possibly I can go into teaching and the other good thing was that maintaining work-life balance would be a little bit more easier than other medical specialities so so many good positive things to look forward to in um this wonderful wonderful profession and that's why i was like okay yes i want to go into dentistry um and I'm glad that I stayed in dentistry for a little bit. I was like, oh, I wanted to be a cardiologist, but then like, okay, well, whatever. Um, so 17 years old, uh, my dental journey um, in 
started in India with five years of dental college, including one year of internship, um, during which we got exposed to uh, practical application of general dentistry in all departments and uh, how to take care of our patients um, comprehensively. Uh, to tell you the truth, um, in the beginning, it was a bit overwhelming for me because I was so young, but um, as the dental college progressed uh, with each new experience, it kept on getting clear in my mind that, okay, I am in the right place. I was meant to be in dentistry. So I graduated from my dental college and uh, I was like, okay, I, I thought that my life is set after I graduated and I started practicing. So I was standing in my purpose and I was like, okay, I'm so happy. But there is a but. Uh, destiny was such that that you know I got married and I moved to US. Um, so my whole planning that okay I'll graduate dental college and then I'll practice general dentistry. It it just my career just went topsy turvy, and that's when the gap year part of my dental journey started. Um, for which I wasn't prepared at all. Um, I was like, okay, I'm here. What am I going to do with my career? Um, but then the thing was that I was like, okay, I cannot just be staying home. I got bored within the next couple within the first couple of weeks when I moved to US. So I'm like, okay, let's do this. And I didn't have any guidance or support at that time. So, uh, I was like, I literally Googled everything, how to be a dentist in US. And I'm like, okay, NBD part one, have to give it. Um, and some of the schools, they are gonna uh, take me as a dental student uh, with part one. So I was like, okay, uh, I started doing my self-study. Uh, and at that time I, I tell everyone, me, Google brother, Wikipedia sister, and my Kaplan book. <laughs> we all were best friends. So that's what I was doing day in and day out. I was studying and it's like in the next couple of months, I gave my NBD part one and I gave my TOEFL and I aced both the exams. And then I was like, okay, when the time comes for me to go to school, I am ready. So at that time too, then again, I started uh, being like, okay, um, with the visa situation and we were moving quite a bit in those years. So we were like, okay, uh, let's start our family. We started our family. I had my son. Uh, now, once after I had my son, I was like, okay, a couple years more passed and then I got pregnant with my second child. Now, again, I was put on crossroads and I, to tell you the truth, I was freaking out a little bit. I'm like, where is NBD part two? I was literally fretting about it. I was like, if I get selected in school, how will I give my part two? The baby is going to come. I'm not prepared to go to school. I'm not ready. Uh, but then the zeal and the stubbornness that I have to go to school, I have to go to school. I just kept on going. Um, and I have to share this story with you all. So bear with me. I studied for the whole nine months during my second pregnancy. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, before the baby comes, I have to give my part two. Uh, there is no way I'm, I'm gonna uh, be able to do it after with two kids, right? And taking care of, of family. So I went to give my part two after preparing, like uh, while I was nine months pregnant, literally like a week, 10 days before my, <laughs> my delivery. And I am like waddling down the Prometric Center. And as I was walking, <laughs> this lady, uh, she was sitting in the counter and I can still remember her precious face. She literally jumped out of her chair and she was like, honey, the hospital is next door. And I'm like, honey, it's okay. I get here to give my test. I'll be here tomorrow too. I promise I'm not going to deliver these two days. We have to give our test. So she was really sweet. And um, uh, I, I love telling this story because it, it was kind of like that. Okay, I have to do it. Like no matter what, I have to keep going. So I uh, 
delivered my baby after a week actually <laughs> and um i passed nbd part 2 and after that like my baby was uh, just a couple months old we moved again we moved to south carolina so at that time again i thought that okay part 1 done part 2 done i am ready now both my kids are with me and i gave my toefl again because by that time it was more than 2 years and TOEFL is only good for two years. So I was like, okay, I'm ready to apply. So uh, along with that, I forgot to mention, I did hold my um, dental license back home. So every chance I got to go back home, I um, attended dental camps and community outreach programs just so that my resume academically, I was doing part one, part two, all these things, but then other things that I could do, I was doing it. So uh, first cycle, I applied to a couple of schools. I got an interview but I didn't make it to the first cycle, right? Uh, but again, uh, it shouldn't be any surprise because I didn't know any better. I didn't prepare well. I was like, when I came back from there and I was like, what was I thinking? Like, what was I thinking? Like, I'll just go there and then get selected. But I learned from that experience, it was a little bit of a kick in the butt for me. So I was like, okay, I have to go prepared in the next cycle. So I took a step back and that's when I started targeting my application very focused and I was very aggressive. I was like, okay, what should I do? Um, what do I want? What do I need uh, to do to, you know, build my dental school application? And uh, I, I was like, okay, I need more hands-on experience in dentistry. Uh, so I literally, like I said, uh, we moved to South Carolina and it was a very small town. There were only a handful of dentists over there. So I'm like, uh, this should be fine. Everybody close together and uh, somebody is going to be helping me, right? So I made a bunch of copies of my resume and I hand delivered it, uh, I believe, to all the dental offices in that town. And I just hoped that, you know, somebody is going to let me start uh, with my observership here. And uh, but nobody called. Uh, it was a couple weeks and I'm like, ah, that's a bummer. <laughs> like somebody should have called me. So I, I'm like, okay, never mind. I went and I reached out again to a couple of dentists and Dr. Davis, he was a private uh, general uh, practitioner over over there and I went to him and I'm like uh, I very honestly put my intent I'm like please uh, give me a few minutes I wanted to talk to you I want to go to ISP program here and I need experience in dentistry in US and I I wanted your permission if I can just come for a few hours and he's like okay yes I'll allow you to come for a few hours every week and that was a uh, he was kind enough to give me that opportunity and that guys was a, was a huge turning point in my career and for the next couple of months um i started observing and shadowing him and very fast he started allowing me to assist him too so which was awesome so i got the experience in both clinical and the business side of dentistry because it was a private practice so it was amazing i just um kept soaking in whatever knowledge they could give me. And from there, I also, after a couple months, I also joined uh, oral and maxillofacial surgery office with Dr. McDonald and Dr. Tuning, uh, same town. And with them too, I used to do uh, observership part-time and I hopped them in the office wherever I could, learned a lot about oral surgery, implants, um, and all these things and basically for the time that I shadowed and volunteered over there I was Dr. Davis's and Dr. McDonald's Dr. Tuning's tail uh, guys I literally was their tail I, wherever they went I was following them around uh, they did have a local um, dental 
club where they used to have conferences like all the dentists would come together and they're going to be like okay implant club this time this uh, that club that time so i used to follow them around i'm like okay it's uh, i'm learning so much and then whatever uh they, they used to go to schools uh to give education I, I would go with them i would volunteer with them for give, give kids a smile they uh things like that so that helped quite a bit um so I'm like, okay, what else can I do? So I was also preparing uh, for my bench test um, at home. Now, this is something I just want to let you all know that bench test only the international dentists who come here who want to go to ISP or advanced learning programs are going to need to give. Pre-dentals don't have to give that during interview. But uh, me as an international dentist, some of the schools, um, I had that and my dream school had that. So <laughs> I was preparing for that at home. And I also gave my part one again. You see this picture over here? This was literally me during my gap years, guys. <laughs> so me and my baby, either her on my lap or me on her lap and studying together. <laughs> so I gave my... Um, Part one again, uh, because it had been a couple more years and I wanted to start applying to schools and I wanted to do everything that I could just so that the admissions committee, they didn't have any other thing to say, but to call me for the interview. So I was like, okay, yes, um, did that, aced it. Then uh, I remember I also applied along with that to a uh, community college biology research department in that town um, to be a research assistant also. Again, research was something that I've, I had never done and I had no clue about. So I was like, okay, I'll learn something new and it will be good for me um, for my school. So I did that, but I had also applied for the second cycle at that time and I got an interview call. At that time, I had only applied to one school. I was like, University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine. I have to apply it and I will get through. So before I joined the, the research uh, uh, place, I got my interview call. I literally went with this mindset. I'll tell you all. I went like, this seat has my name written on it. And that wall will have my picture on it. So I went there and I, uh, it was a beautiful day. I enjoyed the whole process, the interview, the bench test prep. And I was like, okay, yes, I, I, everything is good and it's flowery and it's positive and now it's just the waiting game. And I didn't even apply anywhere else. I was so whatever. So June 5th, I got uh, June 5th, 2010, I got my acceptance call, my acceptance email from University of Colorado, the program director, Dr. Town, she reached out and she was like, Neha, you have been selected. And I was like, I remember me and the kids, we were going for an air show and I was screaming on top of my lungs. I was like, I got selected in dental school. <laughs> And people were looking at me crazy. What is, what is this woman doing? I'm like, don't care. That, that wall is going to have my picture on it. What do you know? So I got accepted. So, and um, two years in dental school were lots of exciting, challenging experiences, both. Um, and lots of fun. I packed my bags, I grabbed my kids and I moved to Denver. So I made some lifelong friendships over there. Um, some of my friends, they have been with me through thick and thin, thin and you guys are going to experience the same kind of camaraderie in dental school. Um, you know, dental community by and large, it's a wonderful giving, loving community you're going to see and you cannot go wrong in choosing um, this profession. So, uh, so yeah, dental school went by so fast. The two years were so fast. I uh, graduated with excellence in operative dentistry award and that recognition among the best of the best, it was huge for me. And, uh, you know, I was so happy. And you see that picture, uh, 
that picture i i was like yes that wall has my picture on it <laughs> I was so happy that was one of the days when I felt so so proud about myself I was like okay I cannot thank my faculty and colleagues enough for everything that I learned in dental school in the ISP program and um yeah I it was huge it was huge and that's where you know my dental journey in US started so you'll see like uh, the, the whole this long story my journey to dental school here has seen so many ups and downs and um so i hope you all got some gems here and there while listening to my stories um along with these things um I did wanted to share some of the things that I share with my pre dental students and dentists in international dentist mentorship program that will hopefully help you um, in the application process. Um, so first off, like uh, people are going to be asking me, okay, Doc, what do you mean by application has to be holistic? You keep on saying that your application has to be holistic. What does it mean by that? I'm like, okay when you are applying to dental schools you have to see that the admissions committee they literally have to go through thousands of applications right and of course the ga the gpa score and uh, your dat score and your gpa is going to be utmost importance um academically that's how uh, the the admissions committee is going to know like uh, that you are a good student right but what sets you apart your journey and your experiences are your own that's what makes you you so and that is what will make your application holistic so you're gonna have to learn and you're gonna have to know how to use it to your uh, benefit right uh, they don't want to just see a bookworm they want to see you doing other things by other things extracurricular activities it can be anything so whatever you like to do it can be within or outside of dentistry. It doesn't have to be that you just keep uh, doing things uh, within extracurricular activities, things that are related to academics or things like that. Dental school wants a well-rounded dental professional as their alumni. So, uh, for example, let me let me tell you this: a lot of uh, a lot of people I ask them like, do you like sports? like use any sport use sports analogy you you can learn so much from there and then apply to dentistry for your application right so all you have to do is just to be able to relate the two things and then be able to express what you learned from it right from sports you can be like learning how you were disciplined like you can work under pressure right it helps like playing tennis can help with hand-eye coordination right same thing with if you like playing any musical instruments what did you learn from the process that's the whole point right so uh other than that what else can you do so keep building on your fine motor skills and keep doing things hand with your hands right dentistry is a work of precision it's a partly work of art we have to work like within tenth of millimeters mostly right so we can do things like we can practice carving like soap or wax uh, easily available as long as you're not allergic to it right you could be drawing you could be playing with wires like we do in ortho that is going to be that is going to be a good experience that is going to be good practical experience for you all one of my students they're like okay i don't know about all of that i like applying eyeliner i'm like wonderful <laughs> that's good <laughs> You're, it's hand-eye coordination there too. I mean, do makeup, whatever floats your boat, right? Um, along with that, lots of shadowing, volunteer work, do a lot of community outreach programs as much as you can. And I understand that with COVID, COVID going on, um, it's hard to get volunteer experience and physically going places for shadowing, uh, but look at this team fresh dental shadowing group they are sitting here all this shows proactiveness all these things show leadership skills it shows growth mindset 
it shows the admissions committee you are at the forefront of things like no matter what uh, what needs to be done you are going to keep going towards your goal that's what they want to see and this is what it means your application has to be holistic in short it just means that it has to be you right all right and then the other important thing is that when you are going to be choosing your schools uh choose your schools and apply early especially true for a lot of our dental schools that have rolling admissions uh, so you don't want to be uh one of the students who is applying like at the at the end of the cycle because their seats are already going to start getting filled up right so and then also when you're choosing schools i want to emphasize on this that think long term don't don't think just four years of school or two years or three years for isps think long term uh, for my pre dentals most of you all are super young right now still but look at me like i when i went to dental school i went with my family so you're going to have to be able to answer these questions like can i practice here can i raise a family here do our uh, the people around me my family how are they going to get affected if i'm over here right um and then you want to see uh, whether you want to stay closer to your family or not like uh, 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 avril was telling me that she's from berkeley so if she wants to stay there or she wants to go to some other school in some other state right um and then look at uh, the location is city life for you is it not for you take a tour of the school at least and if, even if not still schools are giving virtual tours so take them meet other students you want to be able to feel the vibe of the school if you can see yourself there or not right um and with the applying early and choosing dental schools a lot of you know the dental schools with covid-19 going on guys they are aware of the challenges that you all are facing um but at the same time time management wise we can all be proactive right uh, what does it mean by that uh, the exams that you need to give and all the letter of recommendations that you all need so for example the, the that give it early time yourself according to all the exams before the application cycle opens up right um for pre dentals for this year i believe it opens up on may 11th and the submissions will open on june 4th and it will go to february 22nd so and i i provided a link for you all over here too um so there is so much information online make use of it but keep up to date with all of these things just so that you don't lose that that most important time and uh, your application is complete when you apply to schools along with that a couple other things along with that um well, while you are in in your schools right now um if you are still like um in an undergrad uh, student i would say with basic along with the basic biology courses that you have to take uh, you have to take if there are any pre reg courses that you're taking um and if there is an option for pass or fail or graded courses i would opt for graded ones because um again it makes the admissions committee's life a little bit easier because they're going to be able to see um uh, what a uh, good student you are and uh along with that what else um if someone is going through hardships let the schools know guys um 
in the application section uh, the gap years that you have held or uh, sometimes like everybody goes through failures uh, everybody has some kind of trouble one thing or the other so during covid uh, let the schools know what challenges you are facing while going through this there is a special section in the aad sas application um, for disadvantages status for example if you had to uh, change your dates for your DAT, let them know like what happened, what were the circumstances. Um, if someone passed away in your family or uh, I had a student who was not feeling well and so how it impacted you and how did you come out of those hardships and challenges is uh, you can go ahead and put it in in those sections or sometimes in the supplemental application um, area sections um all of these things will give a uh, give a clear picture about you to the admissions committee that who you are as a person who you can be as your alumni um as their student who can you be as a clinician when you start practicing and as a professional so uh, some of the things that i wanted to share with you and keep in mind for your application i hope it helped um now very important if anything if you can remember anything from this session remember this slide okay dentistry is of the people by the people for the people that's what i tell my students remember that good communication and soft skills are a must otherwise a whole lot of misery for everybody involved starting from you right uh, uh, clinical skills a lot uh, most of the dental schools uh they are gonna we learn in dental schools they're gonna teach you clinical skills uh, the business and the other aspect of dentistry not so much um so when you um when you start practicing even when during school right now you need to have good communication skills why uh, for patients you are gonna need to be uh, clearly cohesively coherently be able to tell them educate them what's going on in their mouth what are their treatment options explain them uh, uh, the, the pros and cons for different treatments they're gonna look up to you uh, People are anxious about dentistry. So helping them through their dental anxieties, uh, you're gonna have to be able to communicate all these things clearly. We work with people, they, you're gonna be working with team of people, right? However big or small it is. Like in, I work with the DSO, we work with operations, we work with marketing people. And no matter what position you hold in a dental office, whether you are an associate, whether you are a private practitioner, you are in an army or you're a public health dentist, you are seen as a leader. So having those good, communication skills and soft skills is going to take you long ways in dentistry and these skills can be learned even if you are not um, good like some of my introverts i'm myself an introvert i learned all these things as i was going um you can hone on these skills as you are progressing in your career so start early on and the other most important thing is that don't burn out guys don't burn out i cannot emphasize enough um application process is overwhelming is grueling when you become dental student uh you're gonna be multitasking i'm sure you all are doing it right now too but dental school takes it to a whole new level right um and even like when you're going to be practicing, you're going to be wearing multiple hats at a time. And in general too, dentistry, um, within dentistry, burnout rate is very, very high. So uh, remember, I uh, like I said, if you can remember anything, work at your own pace. Don't look at other people. Work at your own pace. Any everything and everyone has their own timing. So give yourself grace and watch out for your health. Right, health comes first, and by health, not just physically, um, also emotionally and mentally. So 
think smart and work smart and with that uh, stay true to yourself and don't burn out along with this um along with this point all this thing goes hand in hand that you are not alone seek help wherever you need it uh, that was one of my major challenges that i didn't have support and i didn't uh, also know how to ask for help right uh, to tell you the truth and uh, going through my journey it it did get some of the troubles i would have i could have passed if if i would have seeked help and if i would have reached out to people um so be in active learning environments with other pre dental students and people who are in the same boat as yours uh, it does help tremendously network and collaborate with other students right uh, it helps you when you're sharing your same anxieties and stresses it helps tremendously especially with covid-19 going on and we seek help wherever you can i know i know myself like reach out dm me any time i'll be more than happy to help you um or like whichever mentor or coach that you resonate with reach out people are standing by to help um dentistry is a wonderful profession um dental field is full of people who want to help um other people and pre-dents and fellow colleagues so reach out all right you know for advice i go in mummy mode <laughs> all right so let's move over to the um shadowing part of uh, general dentistry so what is general dentistry um in simple terms uh, the general dentist is your first dental professional that a patient sees for their general uh, for their dental care needs and they take care of the patients comprehensively from there if the patient needs to be referred to any specialties they uh, the general dentist is the one who refers them right so basically um, the general dentist provides a comprehensive oral health care needs for their patients um these days general dentists do anything and everything like i said um ce's is so easy to do like uh, i do bone grafts i do uh, lasers i do invisalign so as long as uh, you are doing the same kind of things uh, with the same standard of care as specialists these days general dentists do everything from placing implants to uh, complex ortho cases what not um let's keep going my typical day in general dentistry yeah so i am a bread and butter uh, dentist guys anywhere uh, i see anywhere from 10 to 12 patients in two columns in a day along with that i work with the my wonderful hygienist in her column there are like 8 to 10 patients and um we our typical day is that okay do all different kinds of exams and diagnosis give the treatment uh, options and planning to patients and then i do a whole lot of fillings crowns bridges implant restorations root canals here and there as needed kind of a thing i'm not a big fan of root canals but i do do them um I love extractions and bone grafts, so I do a whole bunch of them. Uh, work on partials and complete dentures. I am Invisalign certified. I do do um, Invisalign cases every um, every month, like a couple new cases and stuff like that. And my favorite part of the day is when I am seeing. kids kids are fun kids are super fun i love working on kids um again taking care of their comprehensive needs whatever is needed um uh, i am a teacher at heart like i said i love educating my patients of preventive uh treatment preventive preventive dentistry is very close to my heart and i always tell everyone that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure so that's what i take to heart and with every single patient that i treat um so a lot of um preventive treatments along with my hygienist of course uh she does a lot of this stuff i couldn't do it without her um 
and I work in collaboration with my oral surgeon and orthodontist. Both of them come to our office a couple times a month. Um, and some of the other specialities, like I said, I'm not a big fan of root canals. So if I need to refer some of my patients to endo or perio, I go ahead and do it. Um, if any patients need uh, medical clearances, the first appointment, uh, especially when I'm taking medical histories for patients or for that matter, every time when they come, um, if I need medical clearances for them, I work in very close collaboration with their primary physicians. And not just the patient management, like I was talking before, that dentistry is also having the management when it comes to the office. We are going to be, on a typical day, we are managing the office quite a bit too, along with the patient management. What kind of complaints uh, do the patients present with? Anywhere from, Doc, I am just here for my exam. I need my cleaning uh, or to I am hurting on my tooth and I have cavities. I need to get my teeth filled or my filling broke. Trauma patients come, we only triage them in our office. Uh, usually I'll just take care of whatever can be done and then refer them to or a surgeon or as needed with specialist a whole lot of people are going to be like i don't like my smile my teeth are crooked then we're going to be working with ortho or ourselves with whitening bonding and ortho um a whole lot of crowns root canals extractions uh google brother is there for everybody a lot of the times patients are going to come and be like oh I think I need a crown over here. Uh, can you go ahead and give me the crown? I'm like, yeah, let me diagnose first. <laughs> but these are the typical complaints that the patients present with a whole lot of times. They're going to be like, like, my gums bleed. I feel sensitive to cold. I cannot eat sugar these days. I was not able to eat ice cream this summer. So those are the typical problems. A lot many times, um, medically complex patients i'll give you an example they come for dental clearances to us or like uh, people in service from army or other places are going to come but typically for our medically complex patients who come like for ex example the patient has to get any of the joints replaced so the pcp or their surgeon is going to be like go ahead and get whatever extensive dentistry or extractions and things like that that you need to be done before before you go ahead and get your joints replaced or for like patients who are having um who have cancer or something like that and they're gonna go ahead and get started with chemotherapy or radiation in particular they are gonna need to get their dental treatment done before radiation so um their doctors are going to be like, okay, give us the clearance that this patient is good to go from dental side and we can go ahead and do our part. Um, we do get referrals from other dentists like um, ortho, doc, uh, they're going to be like, doc, go ahead and take uh, extract the first premolars or uh, working in collaboration with the pediatric um a dentist um like i said i love working with kids sometimes even like uh, a couple of my friends are going to be referring their patients parents sometimes don't want their kids to be sedated or be uh have gen general anesthesia they do sometimes it helps to have another face in front of them to build that rapport from start and um we are able to work on kids so any time we can we do or like some of the patients are just going to come for a second opinion that this is the treatment plan i got i just want to make sure that this is what i need kind of a thing so these are the typical kind of complaints that the patients present with all right so i wanted to share um 
some of the slides on some of the instruments that we use and diagnostic tests that we use. The most important uh, diagnostic tool under a dentist tool belt is dental x-rays. We cannot do anything without dental x-rays. So I am going to be talking about a couple different types of dental x-rays that we use on a regular basis. Um, the first picture that you see that says periapical is uh, the the dental x-rays that we take for teeth uh, straight on it does show the whole tooth and then uh, I'm picky about my x-rays it is supposed to show two millimeters beyond the apex of the root of the tooth uh, the reason being that we want to be able to see if there are any infections going on like in this picture you can see that the sinus is close to the roots of the teeth on that molar so periapicals are usually used to uh, diagnose these kind of things and also for if there is root decay going on or if there is how much of the bone loss is going on, right? The second picture is called interproximal x-rays or bite wings. Bite wings are usually taken when the patient is biting and then you can see like both the the top and the bottom teeth, the maxillary and mandibular teeth, only the crown portion of the tooth is going to show, not the whole tooth. These are mostly used for um, diagnosing decay uh, between the teeth because um, and then also we use it for like when we are delivering our crowns or bridges or implant restorations, then we are able to check for the margins of the restorations. Right. The third picture is called panoramic x-rays. This is basically a big full picture of both the jaws, the teeth, the anatomical structures. So um, we can see a whole lot more on one x-ray over here than doing a whole bunch of periopicals or interproximals, right? And the indications for this is that the oral surgeon might be able to see like, okay, where are the wisdom teeth? Are they impacted? Are they not impacted kind of a thing, right? If they are impacted, how close in proximity are they to the inferior alveolar nerve or the sinuses, right? In kids, we can check that, okay, where are the permanent teeth? Are there any permanent teeth that are missing? We can diagnose um, heart tissue or tumors, other uh, lesions on panoramics. Um, so those kind of things. So panoramics give us like a big picture of our jaws in one picture, basically. The next one is occlusals. Now, I don't take many occlusals x-rays, but they do have their indications. Sometimes we do need, like a child, they cannot go ahead and take periopicals or they're not able to take bite wings. So I'm going to be like, okay, at least I have some x-rays. And then over here, like you can see uh, sometimes impacted teeth, like this impacted canine, we can see it better over here on occlusals than other x-rays, right? Um, or like fractures of the jaws can be seen well on occlusal x-rays. Cephalometrics are usually um, used by ortho. In these um, x-rays, we can uh, see mostly heart tissues, but also like some of the soft tissues, like where are the adenoids? Uh, how much of the air space is there? Where is that tongue in relation to the bottom teeth, right? And then over the ears, as the jaws and the teeth are growing, cephalometric uh, x-rays uh, give a very nice picture of how the child is developing and ortho might be able to kind of see the progress as they are going. So um, this is a beautiful um, thing that uh, beautiful x-rays that or ortho uses it mostly. Now, all these x-rays that I've talked about so far are two-dimensional. Um, CBCTs are three-dimensional x-rays so basically what it means is that it shows us pictures of the teeth in tiny little sections like uh, like the teeth are cut in tiny little 
sections and we can see like what's going on inside them so basically for example like on cbct we can see where the again anatomy is right so the oral surgeon for example is going to be like okay i need to place an implant i'll i'll see if there is enough bone over there to even place an implant if we can how much uh thickness is there of the bone right uh what is going to be the width of the implant what is going to be the height of the implant right are we getting close to any anat anatomical structures or not kind of a thing the endodontist can use cbct and they do use it um heavily these days is like okay are there any accessory canals in the tooth is the tooth calcified is is it going to be a simple uh, root canal sometimes during uh for retreatments they need to use it too so cbct is a, a wonderful thing now i just i just put this picture over here because when we are seeing a patients after a couple of years or when we see uh, the patient for the first time in the office usually we want to get a, a closer look of his whole his or her whole mouth so we're gonna take a bunch of x-rays together so full mouth series is is uh, 18 to 20 x-rays uh, comprising of periopicals and bite wings that we take just so that we are seeing every single tooth every single surface kind of a thing Right, so we can diagnose and treatment plan properly. Okay, other instruments that we use on a regular basis. I'm going to be showing you um, the tray that you see with the purple um, purple paper. It has a couple instruments on it. The first one is the mirror, of course, self-explanatory. The second um, instrument with the yellow um, uh, tip the the yellow tip is the perio probe it is used to measure uh, perio pockets or the space between the gum and the teeth the other end to this instrument is called the uh, an explorer it is used to check for tooth decay uh, we use explorer to check to put it on the tooth and then if there is a catch then we know that there is a decay on this tooth even if it's small the third um instrument that you all see is called a tooth sleuth tooth sleuth is used to diagnose um fractured teeth or if there are any cracks in the teeth like patient is gonna come and they're gonna be like it hurts when i bite so we're gonna have uh the patient bite on the tooth sleuth so they're gonna be biting and then more often than not the patient is gonna be like jumping out on of the chair they're gonna be like ah that hurts ah, why are you hurting so but that's gonna be a good um instrument to use along with a uh, the picture that you see right on the bottom, um, the little light that is put on top of the tooth, that's called uh, a transilluminator. So with transillumination along with the tooth sleuth, we are able to see um, and diagnose cracked teeth um, effectively. Um, you can see like in this picture, there is a frank fracture line going from the top of the tooth to the bottom of the tooth, right? Along with this, uh, what else? I'll go back to the tray over here. The little bottle that you see with the red cap, um, this is Coltine now, and uh, Coltine, and it's called Endo Ice. Endo Ice, we usually uh, use to check for vitality of the tooth, whether the nerve is. Um, basically alive dead or inflamed kind of a thing depending on like i'll i'll put um endo ice on a cotton pellet and then i'll put it on top of patient's tooth if they feel the cold but it goes away like within a couple seconds then um the tooth is normal it's vital if uh the patient a uh, jumps out of the chair or b is like i do not want you to touch my tooth with cold <laughs> we know that the nerve is inflamed and sometimes like if i put it on top of the tooth and it, they don't feel anything that means that that the nerve is necrotic right and then this is how we diagnose and then we treatment plan accordingly Oral ID is a oral ca cancer screening um, device that we have over here. Um, uh, this little box with the goggles and this little flashlight 
kind of thing. So oral ID is used for screening for cancers. Um, we basically put the light on the soft tissues in the mouth and it, um, the, so the normal tissue is going to look different than if the tissue has any kind of pre-malignancy going on. Intraoral camera is a beautiful tool um, that we use in on a regular basis. It is used for patient education. We can show patients what they are, what what is going on in their mouths, and um, all that good stuff. It helps with treatment explanation, treatment conversion. For even for um, dental insurance companies, we can be like, okay, we took the picture and then we send it to them. It shows them that, okay, hey, the tooth had a big amalgam filling and it broke. So we could not just do another big filling. We had to put a cap on that tooth. So it helps with all these things. Disclosing um, solution and tablets are mostly used um, with hygiene or with ortho patients like basically telling them where the plaque is and how good of oral hygiene they have or not have local anesthesia or la i don't mostly use it quite often but sometimes like if the patient comes and be like oh i cannot tell which tooth is hurting over here i'll just put like a drop of um a local on one tooth at a time and then keep moving forward and then if they say that okay yes this tooth is it's not hurting anymore that means that that could tooth could be the culprit okay so i wanted to talk a little bit of um with examples types of dental exams so based on how often we need to see our patients for their cleaning needs or what kind of a perio patient they are and their chief complaint is um what is going to tell us what type of dental exam is needed. Like when we see the patient for the first time in our office, they haven't been seen ever. Then we do the initial or the comprehensive exam and we take the full mouth x-rays, like I said, and then the panoramic just so that we can um, do the complete diagnosis and treatment planning for them. Along with that, uh, we're going to do an intraoral and extraoral exam. We're going to be checking for pockets and other uh, um, perio problems, doing a complete perio eval, and also oral cancer screening. Um, in the least, at least these things need to be done during comprehensive exam. And usually once we have seen the patient uh, in comprehensive exam, and then let's say if the patient just has gingivitis or a couple of cavities, we've, we've fixed everything, um, patient is doing good, then we bring them back um, in six months to see like how everything is going. And during that six month appointment, we could be taking four bite rings, two PAs, uh, or a full mouth x-rays if it's been a long time since we took the full mouth x-rays, right? Um, perio maintenance is usually done um, on patients who have uh, periodontal problems going on, right? Uh, and I'll take you back to that picture, um, Zainab, if you can move it to where we had the full mouth series. There we go. So in this picture, you can see that um, this is a patient who we're going to be calling for perio maintenance, meaning uh, this patient came in, he did not have many problems going on in relation to cavities, but there was a whole lot of bone loss going on. The teeth were mobile, some of the teeth were mobile. And then also there was a lot of tartar. His oral hygiene wasn't good at all. Um, so uh, not just on the tops of the teeth, but the tartar was going underneath the gums so for these patients we want to take care of their perio problems do deep cleaning um, sometimes we need to disinfect the pockets with laser or localized application of certain antibiotics is needed we do all of that and once the patient is doing good then we put them on maintenance for three to four months this patient i put on maintenance after three months um, so they come every three months and we check everything and keep everything on track. And also for ortho patients, it's hard to, like me, it's hard to brush their teeth and then keep plaque under control. Sometimes it can lead to gingivitis, especially in kids. So for them too, we wanna see them more frequently. Um, emergency exam and um, 
limited oral evals for that for those we usually take one by doing and one pa and i have examples for you all for these so we can keep going there all right so complete oral exam um this patient came to me um giving me the medical history was okay he's like oh i am doing fine but it's it's been a couple of years since i went to the dentist so i here's the thing doc and he's like this tooth hurts um he's pointing to number 19 which is the bottom left first molar and he is like oh uh one of my crowns fell off then he's pointing to the top left you can see um the big amalgam filling and the tooth with the root canal that's the first uh, permanent molar and then he is like oh one other tooth broke down and it's hurting me now with hot and cold so you see with patient like this where there is a whole bunch of things going on and there is not just one thing that they want us to focus we do a complete exam so i did the medical history he's good um no medical health problems but he's been a smoker for a long long time he is um in late 20s and he smokes half pack to a full pack and been doing it for the past at least 15 years or so so we're like okay um medical history is fine when i was doing his soft tissue exam so this is what i see and i don't know if you can appreciate it on these pictures but um we can move the next slide um Zainab. You see over here, I start doing the soft tissue exam and I see that there are these white lesions on his cheek mucosa, on the buccal mucosa. And I'm like, and on this number 30 area where we don't have a tooth. So I'm like, okay, tissue is changing colors and it's a thick tissue. Let me go ahead and wipe it off with my gauze and see um, if it comes off. So these kind of white um, lesions, if they come off with the gauze, uh, that means that it could be just candidiasis, candidiasis that's a fungal infection. And um, it's fine we give some medicines and usually it whole it heals on its own but this one did not wipe off um with my gauze so i that raised a bit of concern for me so i was like okay what is it and why did it raise this concern for me and that's why i wanted to share um this case with you um a white patch that cannot be wiped off with gauze and for which an explanation is not obvious to the dentist, it may be defined as a leukoplakia or a leukoplakic lesion, right? Uh, now, why, is, why did it raise a bit of concern for me is because leukoplakic lesions sometimes can be pre-malignant, right? Or pre-cancerous. And this patient has been a smoker, like we discussed for such a long time. So that kind of rang some bells for me. I'm like, okay, so for these kind of patients, what is going to be the next plan of action? We know that the teeth need to be treated, but the first and uh, first and foremost, we need to refer these patients to oral surgery or oral pathology, right? They see this patient, check if... Um, any biopsy is needed or not more often than not they are going to do biopsy of this lesion and they're going to do a histopathological exam and then if it comes out cancerous they are going to start the treatment as needed and if not then these pictures and all these exams that we are doing they're going to be used as benchmark and we follow up with these patients very very closely the oral pathologist or the oral surgeon and and myself, we all are going to be following up very closely because these lesions can turn from pre-malignant to cancerous very, very fast, right? So we also recommend the oral cancer screening with oral ID every six months to a year at least for these patients, right? So as we've seen, um, 
smoking counseling needs to be done the gp is involved and all that good stuff but like i said teeth are important but we are also seeing other supporting tissues we are also seeing other soft tissues and doing the oral cancer screening so these kind of diagnosis these kind of health problems and lesions we need to diagnose early on as general dentist as dental clinicians and we must be able to do so because we need to prioritize the treatment for these patients accordingly then right all right recall exam this is a simple little case i just wanted to show you the picture for like uh this is just something like i said gingivitis a couple cavities here and there but in this case you see this picture on the bottom left we took a couple extra PAs periopicals because this patient had a root canal done on the second premolar which got infected again so they had to be seen with the endodontist again and the endodontist went through the mucosa and the bone and they made a little window and then cleared the infection out and for these patients we are going to again follow up with x-rays every time they come so these are the extra x-rays that we took for this patient but these kind of patients we see on in recall all right we can keep going all right so this is we are coming almost at the end i uh wanted to share this case for limited oral eval like i said or emergency exams the patient sometimes we just focus on a localized area or a localized tooth we are not going to go ahead and take care of everything all together we cannot like sometimes patients are going to be like oh the filling is high so we take care of that or any adjustments needed to be done in limited oral eval we do it but uh, this patient is a true emergency that i saw a couple of days ago actually um so my hygienist comes in and they're like doc we need you uh the patient is bleeding in his mouth and this wasn't a patient that was uh, that ever came to us this was a new patient so i'm like okay i left everything and i i ran to the operatory and we we're like okay we took medical history for the patient and we we're like okay what's going on and he said that nothing he just has high blood pressure but it's well under control he doesn't have any allergies but he was able to tell me that uh, a week before when he came to us he was poking around his gums and cleaning his gums with a toothpick and uh, it seemed that he hurt himself and uh, that's when the bleeding started uh, but that patient he was able to speak and i was able to understand him well but he had a little nasal intonation in his voice and he was having a hard time talking and i could see that oh uh, i had taken a look in his mouth by that time so i could see that he's bleeding and uh, i tried suctioning this red dark red part out it's called a uh, uh, a liver clot but it didn't come out in the suction so i'm like okay did somebody come with him um so his wife came back and she said the same thing she is like he was messing around with the toothpick and it started bleeding and uh, since last night he started bleeding again and today morning he woke up and he had all this blood and he cannot swallow so i so i want to tell you guys this and remember if the site keeps bleeding and a clot forms but then there is continuous bleeding on top of that clot the clot keeps getting bigger in size and this is called a liver clot right and most sometimes it also happens after dental extractions so usually it can be suctioned out or taken out with la with ease but in this case it got so big that it wouldn't come out and on top of it the the tissues in the throat they started swelling the all the all the soft tissues over here they started getting inflamed and the patient was having trouble swallowing and any time a patient has a difficulty breathing or swallowing or they have problem with their vision we want to refer them to emergency immediately so because more often than not they need to be taken care of in the in a hospital setting so i started 911 protocol the wife said we don't want to we don't want to 
uh, we don't want need you to call 911 i'll take him to the emergency so i followed up with them they went to the emergency and lo and behold after a couple of hours when i called again she said that he was transferred transferred to university of illinois chicago in the hospital because they couldn't do an emergency surgery needed to be done and they couldn't do it in the er so Uh, the patient was referred to the hospital where they surgically removed they had to surgically remove that liver clot so i again followed up with the patient uh, he was in hospital for two days and he's been healing good after that um so i shared this case with you because sometimes in dental offices uh excitement exciting things like this can happen and we have to think on feet in the best interest of the patient so you can see that it, it's not just the dental emergencies that we see we saw in both of our major cases that i discussed and again we are working in collaboration with other medical specialties with other dental specialties for patients like such so yeah all right last and final advice for all of you all um brilliant people our future dentists uh, keep your growth and learning mindset on guys and just remember don't burn out it's a marathon not a sprint everybody has one one of the seats that has your name written on it <laughs> so just go with the flow work at your own pace okay and I'm here to help always. Thank you so much for listening to me. All right, thank you so much Dr. Kapila. That was an awesome presentation and um really insightful. Um I think we have a little bit time left so we can ask a couple of questions from the YouTube live chat and Instagram. Sure. But sure. your presentation was pretty thorough so I think we you got a lot of them already. Mhm. Mm Okay, so somebody asked, um, do you recommend taking a gap year to get a master's? So that is a very um, personal choice to make. Like sometimes, and guys, I just wanted to put it out. Gap years are not bad. If you feel like that, okay, some people do go for masters because to improve their GPA or something like that, or they want to go for masters in public health before they go for dental school. All those things uh, can be done. Or if you want to go directly to dental school, that's fine too. That's a very um, personal choice. Or sometimes, like people like me, don't. want gap years but it happens so just make the most out of it and um recommendation is not no not needed but it's not bad either okay and then somebody else asked do you think dental school in america was easier um because you were already a dentist in india were you at an advantage or was it still hard to adjust um again i went with my family <laughs> so a little bit of struggle because my kids were small at that time um but this this the education over here is very different than how we used to study back home the curriculum and the examination the the courses over here are more on point and more practice oriented and yes of course i was already a dentist i had already practiced over there so the academic part was easier the taking care of patients part was easier but having said that uh, isp program was very rigorous so uh, time was time wise it was a little bit cramped up but that's all i would say but definitely being a dentist helped being in dental school if it makes sense okay makes sense and then also how did you go about managing your time in dental school because you know you mentioned that you um had two children and stuff so yes so i had my time management and organization and to this day i guys i'm a type a personality i have I write down everything every minute of my day is accounted for so in dental school too like i said you have so many things to do you have to multitask uh, 
I remember I used to start my day early, um, go to put my kids in daycare, go to school, be in lab, do my lab work all day in school. During lunch breaks, I used to be in lab again. After school, whatever time I got, I was in lab again. <laughs> so all these things you have to manage like with whatever time you got. And academically, like once I was done with everything at home, at night, I remember you saw the picture. I used to meet my baby in my lap or by my side and I used to study at night. So that was my dental school. <laughs> but I would, I would add actually, um, so when I was saying active learning, I was, I, I used to study a lot with my friends. Uh, we were like uh, three or four people who used to study together. Uh, they say that they passed because of my notes because I made good notes and stuff like that. But uh, being in that active environment, I, didn't used to have much time to you know go back and revise things so just listening to them and writing um once that helped me a lot so that's what i would recommend somebody else who doesn't have much time in hand too okay perfect and then i think we have time for one last question mm -hmm. um so uh do you have any tips for connecting and building relationships with your patients because I know you mentioned you like doing peach yeah, and stuff. Yeah, so, uh, yes. So what I do, like I can I can tell you firsthand what I do. Like when I when I see like even a new patient or something and you, you all can use this trick. All of, all of us, like we said, have extracurricular things that we need, that we like to do. Or something for, a, for an example, my birthday just passed and I saw another another person, another patient on chair. I'm like, oh, I'm an 80s. Are you an 80s too? So just kind of trying to find that common ground or with like kids, oh, Peyton Manning is your favorite football player or something like that with guys or with girls. I talk about like, hey, and fashion and all these things so you just have to calm down because dental anxiety is very common people come to us and more often than not they're gonna be like oh I don't want to be here I don't like dentists and things like that and you're gonna have to kind of break that ice right so just be like that but I love you why don't you love me I'm not that scary or things like that or or like how can I help to make this easier for you so the whole point is that to build that patient rapport with um things that they can connect with you because you are a person you are a human being they are human beings um and yeah so it helps just just to be and I talk a lot like I <laughs> I talk a lot, so that helps them too. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Kapila. Those are all the questions we had, and yeah, we really, really appreciate um, all your time. You are very welcome, guys. Reach out. I am on Instagram. Reach out on DDS Coach, or this is my website, www.dentistcoach.com. All other social media platforms are over there. I'd be more than happy to help. 